Cause every morning It's like a picture that you've painted for me A love letter in the sky Story I could have had a really different story But you came down from heaven to restore me Forever saved my life Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus I stand in awe of your amazing ways I worship you as long as I am breathing God, you are faithful and true Nobody loves me like you Mountains You're breaking down the weight of all my mountains even when it feels like I'm surrounded You never leave my side Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus I stand in all of your amazing ways I worship you as long as I am Oh, what a song to sing Oh, what a song to sing Oh, what a song to sing Oh, what a song my heart keeps singing Oh, what a song to sing Oh, what a song child of God. Yes, I am. Nobody loves me like you. Nobody loves me like you. All right. You know, in the old days, when something fishy was going on, they said, something is afoot. Something is afoot in my church. I've been gone on vacation one week, and I come back, and there's a mic that says, Vite, Virginia Tech, something is afoot. There is a Virginia Tech fan loose in our church. It wasn't like that when I left. All right, Kathleen. I think we ought to have a UVA mic too, don't you? Yeah. Amen. You know, in, in all, to be politically correct, we got to have a. 
But hey, we're glad you're here. And uh, we've got a guest speaker. I was on vacation uh, last week, and Brandon from over at Covenant Bible has graciously said he'd come and preach for us this morning. And Brandon has breakfast with us down at McDonald's every Thursday morning. He's a brand new dad. And uh, you, you loving it, right? Yeah, yeah. So you got a puppy, you got, you got a puppy and a boy all, all in the same year, right? And, and you're going back to school too. So you got a lot going on, don't you? Yeah. You know, I, I think the world will brand new except for one thing. There's one thing that we really disagree on, and, you know, and I've asked him not to bring it up in the sermon today out of respect for me. He is a huge North Carolina Tar Heel fan. And I've been praying for him, and I've, I'm trying to convert him, but, uh, you know, he, he's just dyed blue. You know, he just sees that Tar Heel blue everywhere. But no, all jokes aside, it's been great to fellowship with this young man. He loves the Lord. He's dedicated his life to serving the Lord. It was a big part in Teen Week just recently, and 16 teenagers come to know Christ. That was a great week. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So praise the Lord. So, Brandon, come and share with us what God's laid on your heart. you packed the lunch. <laughs> well, good morning. Well, I feel very welcome after having my Carolina fandom made fun of by the pastor. It's, uh, I've always thought that there's a reason that God made the sky Carolina blue, amen? <laughs> well, first of all, just let me say what a privilege it is to be here with you this morning. I look around this morning and see people that I'm blessed to call friends. And I can honestly tell you that your church is an incredible blessing to Covington Bible Church and to me personally. It is such a special thing to see two churches that are willing to work together to advance the cause of Christ in our community. I count it as a great privilege to be able to spend time with Brother Billy as well, as he mentioned. Uh, we get together every Thursday for breakfast, and it is such a blessing to be able to talk to someone with, uh, with the wisdom of Brother Billy. And uh, in, in all honesty, his graciousness, his humility, and his faithfulness in ministry are traits that I can only hope to live up to in my own life, and I'm very thankful for him. With all that being said, I'd like to begin today by asking you a question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word theology? For most people, theology is a dusty, boring word. And if that's your reaction, please know that you're not alone. For you, theology might bring to mind bearded men in long robes sitting in an ivory tower somewhere writing about things with impossible names like superlapsarianism or antinomianism. If you're curious about what those mean, I'm sure Billy would love to speak with you following the service <laughs> about that. For you, theology might bring to mind this, and please know that I only brought these as props, so please be comforted, but for you, Theology might bring to mind books that are as dry as they are long and harder to read straight through than Webster's Dictionary. For you, theology might bring to mind a Bible college or seminary education, some period of your life devoted to studying this thing that we call theology. And today, I'm going to be preaching to you about theology, but before you let your eyes glaze over and I lose you completely... Let me tell you that I'm not going to stand here today and say, well, you need to read each and every one of these books that I brought with me. I'm not going to stand here and say, well, you need to go out and get a Bible college degree or else you're never going to amount to anything as a Christian. That's not what I'm going to try and tell you at all. So just before you get too worried, I need to define theology for you. Theology, when you get right down to it, is very simple. The word theology comes from two Greek words, theos, meaning God, and logos, meaning an idea or a concept. So basically, theology is what you think about God. And that means that everyone, whether you like it or not, 
is a theologian. Now, there are good theologians and there are bad theologians, but you are going to be one or the other. No matter how you feel about God or Christianity, you are a theologian. You are someone that has thoughts about God. Even an atheist believes in a certain theology. Their theology, their thoughts about God, is that God does not exist. And yet for so many people, theology, what you think about God, doesn't seem to be all that important. And if we were talking about something like our favorite foods or favorite TV show, then that would be fine. Whether you like fried chicken or chicken fettuccine Alfredo isn't going to affect very many other areas of your life. Whether you prefer comedies or dramas isn't going to tell me very much about the rest of who you are. But when it comes to what you think about God, that affects every other area of your life. And so if our theology is so important, don't we want to make sure that we have it as correct as we possibly can? So what I'd like to do today is take a look at what the Bible has to say about our theology. We're going to spend most of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and you can turn over there if you'd like. And today I'd like to take a look at this passage and see what it has to say about why theology matters. But first, let's take just a moment and ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Let's pray. Father God, it is a blessing to be able to come together in your house this morning and worship you. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to be called by you to worship you and Lord, as we are gathered here today, God, I pray that everything that is done would be completely to your honor and your glory. Lord, we have the chance to worship you in several different ways already, but Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, God, I pray that you would be worshiped through the preaching of your word. God, I pray that you would be lifted up and made great in our midst through the preaching of your word. God, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, I pray that your spirit would Work in the hearts of each and every person that's gathered here today. God, I pray that you would transform each of us to be more like you than we were when we came here this morning. And God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first reason that we're going to look at today that shows us why theology matters in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 is that right theology is necessary for salvation. Right theology is necessary for salvation. Let's start reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now just before we go any further with this, I want to make one thing very, very clear. Right theology alone will not save you. Right theology alone will will not save you. And that might seem like a very obvious thing to say, but when you get right down to it, there are many people here in our area, here in our community, who are trusting in their theology what they think about God to save them. I talk to people all the time who, when I ask them if they're a Christian, they'll say, oh yes, I believe in God. I believe in God. What those people are doing is trusting in their theology to save them. And if you're here today and your claim to being a Christian is simply that you believe in God as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I owe it to you to tell you that your belief in God is not on its own going to save you. That sounds very harsh, but please hear me out because I don't want a single person to leave here today not understanding this. The Bible says in James chapter 2 that even the demons believe in God and they tremble. The demons in hell right now believe in God with every fiber of their being. They have incredible theology. They've seen firsthand who God is and what he can do. Some of them have been cast out of people by Jesus. They know exactly who he is. 
and yet they are condemned to forever be part of the forces of evil. Your belief that God exists will not, on its own, save you. And once again, I realize that it might sound to you like I'm preaching some sort of new gospel, and I promise you that I'm not. Look right here in this passage in 1 Corinthians. Paul starts out by saying that when he came to this church at Corinth, he did not come speaking with some sort of fancy speaking skills. He says in verse 2 that he didn't even want to try and do that. But when you study the life of Paul, you'll learn that he probably couldn't have done that even if he had wanted to. From all the evidence that we can glean about Paul from his writings in Scripture and the writings of the church fathers, Paul was not a dynamic speaker. He was no Billy Graham, if you will. What's more, Paul wasn't much to look at. Most Bible scholars believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh was an eye disease, and the certain disease that these scholars say that he was most likely to have had would have made one or both of Paul's eyes pretty hideous and deformed. Paul was not much to look at. But he says here that he didn't even try to present himself as this dynamic speaker because all he wanted to do was to preach Christ crucified. All he wanted to do was to preach to these people the sweet, simple gospel. And just a moment ago, I told you that believing in God is not enough on its own to save you. And that's true, but at at the same time, it's very important to also not leave you hanging with just that. Because the other side of the coin is that there is a level of proper theology that is necessary for salvation. Hebrews 11 puts it this way. It says that anyone who wants to come to God must believe that God exists. And so with that in mind, let me tell you what Paul was talking about when he preached Christ crucified. The gospel starts with God. Almighty God, the ruler of the universe, is holy. He told us this back in the Old Testament, but God's holiness creates a problem for us. You see, Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What, what this verse literally means is that all of us are continually falling short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us have sinned, and because of that, every moment of every day, we are continually falling short of God's glory. And there is nothing that we can do to overcome that. People say all the time, well, I'm a pretty good person, and in the end, God's going to see that my good outweighs my bad. That's a nice sentiment, but unfortunately, the Bible is very clear that nothing could be further from the truth. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. No matter how much good we try to do, it is as worthless to God as a pile of filthy rags. When you stand before God on your own merits, he's not going to be concerned with how much good you've done. He's only going to be concerned with your sin. And if you've sinned once, no matter how small, you're done. James chapter 2 verse 10 says that if you keep the whole law and only break in one place, you are as guilty as if you'd broken the whole thing. You are condemned. Romans 6 23 tells us that the payment, the salary that we are owed for our sin is death. At the end of this life, because of the sin that separates us from God, we are bound for an eternity of fiery torment in hell. And that is all very, very bad news. And yet, God loved us anyway. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still worthless, broken sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God wanted to make a way for us to be with him, but because of our sin, someone had to be punished. And so he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to earth to live among us. And Jesus lived the sinless, perfect life that none of us ever could. And then he went and gave up his life to die on a cross. And as Jesus hung on that cross, God was able to take our sin and place it on him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that for our sake, he made him to be sin 
who knew no sin so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. And as Jesus died, the punishment for our sins was carried out on him. And yet the story doesn't end there. A normal man couldn't take the punishment for other people. I can't take the punishment for you. Jesus had to have some sort of special power to save us from our sins. He has that power because he is God's son, and he demonstrated that power three days after he was killed when he rose to life again. 1 Corinthians 15.4 says that he was raised again just as the scriptures foretold. And Jesus Christ has the power to offer life. The second half of Romans 6.23 says that not only are the wages of sin death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how do we get this life? How do we get this righteousness that comes from God? Because as incredible as this story is, not everyone is saved. Coming to this church doesn't automatically save you. And just believing that God exists doesn't automatically save you. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And this is where this exchange takes place. First, you must believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave just as the Bible says he did. And second, we see this phrase in this verse that we must confess Jesus as Lord. Quite simply, we see in this phrase why so many who believe that God exists are not saved. They are not willing to make Jesus Christ Lord of their life. You see, you can believe with all your heart that God exists, but if you're not willing to turn from your sins and accept Christ as Lord of your life, then you're not going to be saved. Romans 10.10 10 says that with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. At the moment of salvation, God offers you the free gift of salvation and with the hand of faith, you must reach out and accept the gift. That's the preaching of Christ crucified that Paul brought to the Corinthian church and that's the preaching of Christ that will save you today. If you're here today and you believe in God, if you've been in church all your life, but you're not really ready to turn from your sins and turn to Christ, then you really ought to examine your heart. I'm not going to stand here and try to convince you that you're not saved. But I will tell you honestly today that I am haunted by the thought that there are people who attend Bible preaching churches just like this one who are convinced that they are saved. And yet they will die and spend eternity in hell because they never grasped the gospel. And if you're here today and you are not sure, no matter how long you've been a part of this or any church, please don't let your pride keep you from talking to someone about this. Your eternity matters too much to let appearances keep you from being sure. Theology matters because right theology is necessary for salvation. The true gospel, the preaching of Christ crucified that Paul brought is something that we simply can't do without. So Paul tells these people that he didn't want to give them some sort of lofty speech or great words of wisdom. He wanted to give them the gospel of Christ. And in verse 5, we see an incredible statement that drives this point home, that right theology is so critical to our salvation. Paul says that he wants their faith to rest not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I'll just tell you very plainly, if your faith is resting anywhere but in the power of God revealed in the gospel, you're setting yourself up for disaster. Theology matters to us because right theology is critical to our salvation. Secondly, we see that theology matters because theology offers us a deeper knowledge of God. We should want to know more about God. When you love someone, you are going to want to know that person more. And I realize that it does sound really dusty and academic to say you should want to have a deeper knowledge of theology. So just let me put it this way. 
You should love God more than any other person in this world. And you should want to get to know the God that you love better and better. At the simplest level, that's all that learning theology is. If theology is what you think about God, then learning more about theology is simply learning more about God. And you don't have to dive into words that are 12 syllables long or become some sort of monk to do that. Take a look at what Paul says in these next several verses. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So in the first verse of this passage, Paul says that he's talking to the mature now. He indicates that his focus is moving from those who are in need of the gospel to those who are saved. And Paul begins to show that for people in this category, our learning about God shouldn't just stop at the point of salvation. Paul says that the mature are still receiving wisdom, but it's not the wisdom of this age. It's not the wisdom of the rulers of this age because there will come a time when all of that will pass away. This wisdom that is being revealed is a hidden wisdom that people who are of this world do not understand. But notice what Paul writes in verse 10. He says that the Spirit, he's talking about the Holy Spirit here, searches everything, even the depths of God. And then down in verse 12, he says that we have received that very same Spirit of God. So basically what Paul is saying here is that when you are saved, we know that you receive the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, and the Holy Spirit helps us understand more and more about God. As I read these verses this week, I thought, oddly enough, about my wife Brittany and I's Netflix account. Now we have to pay so much every month to access the shows and movies that are on Netflix, And if we don't pay our monthly subscription, we will not be able to access that content. Now, you might be sitting there and thinking, well, I don't have to pay for Netflix because I use somebody else's password. But even still, somebody somewhere is paying for you to watch Netflix. The old saying is that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And it seems like everywhere you look in life, there's things that you have to pay for. It's very hard to find something that's truly free. And I certainly respect people's need to make a living, but I sure am glad that God doesn't take his truth and make us pay a monthly subscription for it. Paul says here that the Holy Spirit knows God, which makes sense considering that he is God, and that when we are saved and get the Holy Spirit, we get access to that treasure trove of truth. We don't have to pay $5.99 to read 1 John or pay $14.99 to study God's holiness. God never says, all right, listen, after you read these five chapters, after that it takes a subscription to keep reading. It's all right here for us. God tells us that he loves us and he wants to have a relationship with us and he wants us to get to know him better. And there's no part in his word that is restricted to us. I'm currently working on my master's degree, and several months ago, I was having breakfast with the president of my seminary, and we were talking about people that we knew who had incredible insight into the scriptures without the benefit of formal training. 
And this man began to tell me about this man who had been a pillar of his church during his 25 plus years of pastoral ministry. And this guy only had a sixth grade education. This man said that this guy in his church who didn't have so much as a high school diploma would say things about God and the Bible that would blow his mind. He said that he was one of the greatest Christians that he ever knew because even though he wasn't well educated by the world standards, he had gotten to know God very, very well. And this seminary president is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. He has a doctorate and several other advanced degrees. And this seminary president said that he has quotes written all over the inside cover of his Bible that this guy had said in different Bible studies. And this seminary president said, you know, people like that keep me humble. He said, you know, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in degrees and titles, but it's so important to realize that any Christian anywhere has access to the exact same truth that everyone else does. When Billy opens up his Bible to study for his next sermon, he's not going to pull out some secret pages that were given to him when he received his degree or when he became a pastor. It's the same Bible that all of us have, and it's the same truth that all of us have. God opens up his truth to all of us, and we should take advantage of that. Theology offers us a deeper knowledge of God, and while that statement might bring to mind something dry and academic, it really shouldn't. In its purest, simplest form, it's just getting to know God better, and that's something that all of us should do. So we can see in this passage that theology offers us the opportunity to get to know God better. And then the last thing that we can see in this chapter is that theology produces transformation. Let's read the last few verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll pick this back up in verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So once again in these last few verses of this chapter, we see that this spiritual truth which comes from God is not for those who are not saved. Apart from a work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, spiritual truth is going to make no sense to us. Verse 15 tells us that the spiritual person is able to judge all things, but are themselves judged by nobody. Let me just stop right there for a second and say that this verse does not give you a free pass to be judgmental, and it doesn't mean that nobody else is able to discern your mistakes. In the context of this passage, What this means is that when you have the Holy Spirit within you, he gives you the ability to apply spiritual truth to every area of your life in a way that you couldn't do on your own. By the same token, if an unbeliever were to look at you, they would never be able to accurately judge your inner nature because it makes no sense to them. And then verse 16 says that the result of this exchange is, that takes place as the Holy Spirit enters our hearts and begins to teach us about God is that we have the mind of Christ. This is the result of a radical transformation in our mind and hearts. And it comes through a continually deepening relationship with God. Theology produces transformation in our hearts. And once again, it's important to emphasize what I mean by theology because for four years I went to college and took courses on theology and there were people in those classes with me who were not transformed by that truth. In just the same way, there's people who attend church and sit under Bible preaching and teaching for years and are never transformed. Just being around truth is not necessarily enough to produce transformation. Just this week, I was once again thinking about uh, this fact as I was scrolling through social media on just Friday, two days ago, and I saw a pastor who was a very well-known, nationally known, quote-unquote, celebrity pastor, 
This is a guy who has written books that have been New York Times bestsellers, sold over a million copies. He was the pastor of a megachurch that had campuses all across the country. I mean, one of these guys that you look to is like a hero of the faith in our generation. And this pastor, two days ago, posted on social media that he is no longer a Christian. He posted that he completely rejected any truth about God or Jesus Christ, any truth that is revealed in the Bible. And you know, that really hit me like a slap in the face. You know, it's, it's so easy to think, well, I've been a Christian for X number of years. I've been going to church for X number of years. And to think that we've somehow achieved some sort of status in the Christian life where we're okay and we've arrived. But you know, just being around the Bible just being around truth, even just being around other believers is not necessarily enough to guarantee that we are going to become more like Christ. Unless we have the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts, it's not going to work. And apart from a work of the Holy Spirit, none of us would come to Christ for salvation and none of us would be kept in our salvation by the power of God. And so may I say to you this morning that While it is a privilege to be in a Bible-preaching church, do not take that for granted and think that that is going to make you the kind of Christian that you need to be. That truth needs to be internalized. It is so important to allow God to do whatever he wants in your heart, to make whatever changes he wants to make to make you more like him. And as Paul says here in this passage, we will begin to have the mind of Christ. And this is just one more area where theology becomes huge for us. Our theology impacts every area of our life. Now that sounds like a very big, broad statement, so let me explain what I mean. As we just saw in this passage in 1 Corinthians, as we internalize God's truth and allow it to work in our hearts, it leads to a change in our minds and our hearts. Theology produces transformation. And if our minds truly are being transformed to be more like Christ, we are going to see that reflected in our day-to-day lives. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 6, 43 to 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A transformed heart leads to a transformed life. And it is in that way that theology, the truth that we believe about God, affects the way that we live even in the most mundane parts of our life. The way that you view God will affect the way that you work at your job. The way that you view God will affect the way that you approach your schoolwork. The way that you view God will affect the way that you interact with your family. And that's going to happen whether you think about it or not, and really whether you like it or not. Whatever is in your heart is going to come out in your life. There's never a morning where you have to wake up and say, you know, I really need to make sure that my theology impacts my life today. That's going to take care of itself, even if your view of God is lacking. Which brings me back to my original point that you are a theologian. You are someone who has thoughts about God. Now, you might not be one of these theologians who are so deep that they write books on it. But make no mistake, you have ideas about God. They're either right or they're wrong. They might be rich or growing, or they might be sparse and dead. But you have ideas about God, and so that makes you a theologian. If you're anything like me, you might think, well, I'm not smart enough to be a theologian. Personally, I don't really consider myself to be all that smart. I I, I certainly don't think of myself as some great thinker or anything. And I have a feeling that I'm not the only person here who feels that way. But here's the great thing. God has revealed himself to us in a way that he intends for us to understand. God didn't write the Bible to confuse us. And so God, as he he tells us in this passage today, gives us the Holy Spirit to help us understand. 
It doesn't take big flowery language to understand truths about God. And we are not on our own as we try to get to know God. So here's my challenge to you. You are a theologian. You have ideas about God. But the thing is, you are either a good theologian or a bad theologian. Ideally, this is where you nod your head and think, I want to be a good theologian. If you've made it to this point in the message and you want to be a bad theologian, I'm going to feel very bad about my preaching ability. Hopefully you want to be a good theologian. Hopefully you want to have right thoughts and ideas about God. But sitting here today and thinking that you want to be a good theologian isn't going to make that happen. So right now my challenge to you is I want each and every one of you to come up with a so what. There was a preacher that I heard one time who liked to challenge people to come up with so what's. And basically what that means is that when we encounter God's truth, we want to allow ourselves to be changed by it. So my challenge to you is right now where you're sitting, decide how you are going to get to know God better this week. One concrete way. If you're in the habit of reading God's word during the week, that's obviously a great way to do that. If you don't spend much time in God's word, this would be a great time to say, by God's grace, I'm going to spend time in the Bible this amount of time this week. My point is, don't leave here today without a concrete plan for how you're going to get to know God better this week. I was thinking this week about a time not long after we were married that my wife, Brittany, downloaded a list onto her phone of over 100 questions to ask your spouse. And every time we would get in the car, she would ask me some questions. And it took a couple of months to get through the whole list. But it really meant a lot to me that she was serious about continuing to get to know me. It made me feel very loved as her husband to know that Brittany was that committed to getting to know me as well as possible. And don't you think that it would honor God if we were to say, God, I love you. I want to know you as closely as I can, and here's what I'm going to do by your grace to accomplish that. Theology matters. It leads us to salvation. It offers us a deeper knowledge of God, and it has the power to transform our lives. What are you going to do to get to know God better? I'm going to give you just a moment to think about that, and then I'm going to pray. Father God, we are so thankful for your truth, which you reveal to us in your word. God, I thank you that you love us enough that you gave us the Bible, that you inspired it, that you have worked through the centuries, through the lives of so many people, so that we can hold a copy of your word in our hands today and read it. God, I pray that we would not take that for granted. God, I pray that we would not take for granted what we think about you. God, I pray that we would always have a hunger and a desire to learn more about you and to know you, whether we've been saved for a month or for 50 years. God, I pray that we would always be hungering to learn more about you. And God, I pray that by your grace that that truth would transform our hearts and our lives. God, I pray that you would use your truth to make not just Faith Baptist, but all of the Bible-preaching churches here in our community to be more like you. God, I pray that you would light a fire in our hearts so that we would go out into our community and advance your glory, to advance the fame of your great name. And God, if there's anyone here that did not maybe grasp the gospel, or if there's someone here that knows the gospel but they've never accepted your gift of salvation. God, I pray that you would work in their heart right now today. God, I pray that they would find someone and talk to them and that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, we thank you for how good you are to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. Billy.